Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all lines are in the listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the meeting over to your host, Lauren Alder-Reed. Good afternoon, everyone, or morning to those of you joining us in a different time zone. And welcome to everyone in the room who I know is in our time zone, at least physically. Um, we are happy to welcome you today to EDOR's first official webinar and conference call public outreach event. We hope that this is the first of many, and we would encourage you to come to us with your ideas for topics or issues of interest to you as individuals or as organizations. If you wish to reach us, you can do so by email at p, as in Paul, a-o dot e-o-i-r at usdoj.gov, and that is our main office mailbox. You can also reach us by phone at 703-305-0289. So today's session, as the operator noted, will be recorded, and the reason we're recording it is for training purposes. As the operator indicated, if you do not consent to that recording, uh, we ask that you either don't speak or disconnect. Uh, the format of the presentation today will be approximately a half an hour of our disciplinary counsel, Jenny Barnes, Jennifer Barnes, excuse me, speaking on attorney discipline matters and rules and procedures of professional conduct. When we finish the presentation, we will open the line to question and answer, or questions for answers. The operator will indicate at that time you will press the number one, I believe, and that will put you in queue. We will take questions as they're entered as the operator presents them to us. The operator will ask at that time for your name and organization, and we ask for that simply so that we can, can understand where you're coming from when you ask your question and perhaps help clarify some, some answers. When we do open for questions, we ask that you do not ask any individual case questions. Anecdotes are fine. But uh, should you ask an individual case question, we'll ask you to move on to your next question or we'll move on to the next caller. We will take questions through 3.30 p.m., at which time the call will end, and we would then welcome any additional questions through our email address or phone number provided previously. I'd now like to introduce Jennifer Barnes, our disciplinary counsel. She's been with EOR for 18 years, received her Bachelor of Arts degree in 1976 from Miami University a Master of Social Work degree in 1979 from The Ohio State University, and a Juris Doctorate in 1988 from the University of San Diego School of Law. From 1994 until April 1995, Ms. Barnes served as appellate counsel for the former INS. From 1990 until 1994, she worked in the Office of the General Counsel for INS as an Assistant Attorney, excuse me, Assistant General Counsel, and then as an Associate General Counsel. Ms. Barnes joined GOJ through the Attorney General's Honors Program in 1988, serving as an INS trial attorney in San Francisco. She is a member of the California and District of Columbia Bars and a member of the National Organization of Bar Council. Jenny? Thank you, Lauren, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining our, um, our first webinar. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, the EOR rules for professional conduct, and then, of course, we'll get to the questions later, and hopefully I'll be able to answer all of your questions. If you're following along with the PowerPoint, um, our first slide basically uh, talks about our statutory um, right and our regulatory right to uh, have the attorney discipline program with the EOIR. Um, we are under the general 1362 right to counsel provision, and then the regulations um, were amended to specifically address uh, the attorney discipline program as being under the general jurisdiction of the Office of the General Counsel for the Executive Office for Immigration Review. Um, the EYR rule to professional conduct applies to practitioners, which is a term that we developed to include the following um, types of representatives. Practitioners are licensed attorneys. They also include accredited representatives with recognized organizations um, as recognized by the Board of Immigration Appeals. It includes law students and law graduates and uh, reputable individuals, which is an additional category under the regulations. The rules, however, do not apply to government attorneys. Government attorneys 
are um, regulated by uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility, either through the Department of Homeland Security or through the Department of Justice. The Attorney Discipline Program uh, originated years ago with the legacy INS, uh, but in May of 1994, an Inspector General's report recommended that the program be transferred from Legacy and INS to the Executive Office for Immigration Review. So in that vein, we worked on uh, drafting a proposed rule that was published on January 20th of 1998. Um, we consulted with various state bars and uh, came up with a rule that we thought uh, was much improved over the existing rule. We received over 500 public comments to that proposed rule and the final rule was ultimately published in June of 2000 and went, went into effect in July of 2000. We lived with the rule for quite a while uh, before we determined how we needed to amend the rule. Um, so we amended the rule in July of 2008 with a proposed rule. This time we only got four public comments, so I guess we were headed in the right direction. And the final rule was published in December of 2008 and went into effect on January 20th of 2009. The original grounds for discipline that were in the, the existing rule in 2000 um, are here on, on the screen. You can see these are, these are grounds that um, have existed for, for quite a while. Some of these grounds we use more often than others, um, uh, such as false statements of material or fact. Um, those can be false statements made either in open court or it could be in, in writing in the form of a brief or a motion. Um, obviously, one of the more common grounds that we use is uh, an attorney who's been subject to a final order or of suspension or disbarment by a state or federal court. Um, those would be reciprocal cases where we would initiate reciprocal discipline against an attorney who has already been suspended or disbarred by a state bar or by a federal court. Um, the ground involving contumelious or obnoxious conduct is, is a ground that was already in the rule and um, unfortunately we've, we've had to rely on this ground of discipline uh, more often than you might imagine. Um, Basically, we reserve uh, using this ground of discipline for uh, very egregious cases of um, professional misconduct. Um, basically, um, this would be an attorney who uh, is acting uh, in an unprofessional manner, either in open court towards an immigration judge, but we've also interpreted this ground fairly broadly in that we also um, up, use this ground when we learn of behavior on, on the part of an attorney um, that involves court staff or court employees, um, the person sitting at the window at the immigration court or at the Board of Immigration Appeals. So we take a particularly broad view of this that um, attorneys should be conducting themselves in a professional manner regardless of, of who they're coming in contact with at the court, whether it's other litigants, whether it's the judge, or whether it's a court, any court staff or um, court employees. But, but uh, we do reserve this for particularly egregious behavior, and, and, uh, but, but we have used it in the past. Uh, attorneys who've been convicted of a serious crime are subject to discipline under these rules. Um, Attorneys who engage in any kind of frivolous conduct, um, typically that occurs, um, you know, in a brief or a motion or uh, applying for certain forms of relief. Um, attorneys who engage in ineffective assistance of counsel, um, this is a grounds for discipline as well. Um, the ineffective assistance of counsel is a finding that has to have been made by an immigration judge or the Board of Immigration immigration appeals in order for us to go forward. So if, if an immigration judge or the board has made a specific finding that an attorney has engaged in ineffective assistance of counsel, that would subject them to discipline under these rules. Um, a very common ground that we see um, all too often um, 
our complaints about attorneys who repeatedly fail to appear for scheduled hearings in a timely manner without good cause. Unfortunately, we get complaints like this every week. Um, attorneys who fail to appear, um, uh, there's no notice to the court. Um, it, it, it's disruptive to the court proceedings and, and it actually delays uh, the, the ability for the alien to um, have his case heard in front of an immigration judge. So we routinely get complaints, unfortunately, about attorneys who, who just don't show up for their scheduled hearings, and um, we're trying to, to um, address that um, on a case-by-case -case basis. I should also, um, just going back to the um, reciprocal discipline ground for attorneys who have been subject to a final order of suspension or disbarment by a state or federal court, the, uh, the rules of professional conduct do have a self-reporting requirement. So any attorney who has been subject to discipline by a state or federal court in the form of a suspension or disbarment is um, under an obligation to report that misconduct to um, to the disciplinary counsel's office. Um, occasionally, we do have an attorney who does self-report, but most of the time, we find out about a suspension or disbarment through through other means. So, the new rules that we added in uh, 2009, many of these rules are based on the ABA model rules of professional conduct. Uh, many of these will look very familiar to, to most of you, um, particularly the grounds that deal with competence, diligence, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, scope of representation, communication. These are all grounds that are commonplace um, in every bar in the country and are, are based on the model rules of professional conduct. Um, promulgated by the ABA. So you'll see very, very similar language in the regulations with regard to those, to those grounds. Um, we added a few additional grounds that were particularly problematic in the area of immigration law, it seemed to us. Um, uh, we were getting a lot of complaints, um, particularly from the Board of Immigration Appeals regarding the last um, ground on your screen that dealt with repeated filings that indicated a substantial failure to competently and diligently represent the client. In other words, sort of a, a boilerplate brief type of grounds for discipline or boilerplate motions. Um, unfortunately, there are attorneys that we've learned about who basically just sort of regenerate the same brief or the same motion, maybe a motion to reopen over and over for, um, you know, different clients, but it's basically the exact exact same language down to the typographical errors and and the font. So we know that, that um, these particular aliens are not being competently represented if their attorney isn't um, identifying the unique circumstances and the facts of each of their cases and then arguing those cases to the to the board or to a court. Oftentimes these um, these filings don't have any argument. It's basically a recitation of, of the law, and then there's no argument or no application of the law to the particular facts of the case. So in the case of an appeal to the board, there's really nothing for the board to look at because there's no argument. Um, there's no advocacy being, being made on, on behalf of the client. Um, the notice of entry of appearance grounds for discipline basically um, just requires that uh, attorneys who are actually um, representing uh, clients, representing aliens, um, have to file a notice of entry of appearance form, either the EOIR 27 with the board or the EOIR 28 with the court. Um, basically, this is, uh, this is the ground that we uh, came up with in order to uh, deal with, with the whole ghostwriting problem that we were seeing where you could tell that an attorney had drafted this brief or drafted this motion, but the alien had signed it and 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 sent it off as if um, he were pro se when when he really was clearly being represented by an attorney. So we require an attorney who's actually representing a client to um, file the notice of entry of appearance with the board or with the court. So we'll move on to um, the next slide which talks about the various types of sanctions. 
Um, the Obviously, the most severe sanction would be disbarment, and disbarment is presumptively permanent. However, there is a provision in the regulations that even a disbarred practitioner can apply for reinstatement um, after after one year. Um, it's a, it's a higher bar, obviously, for an attorney who's been disbarred to be reinstated, but it's very important that uh, we felt it was important that attorneys had the right to um, petition for reinstatement and explain why they think that they should be um, allowed to continue to practice immigration law. Um, there are suspensions either for t certain time periods or um, there is uh, indefinite an indefinite suspension option. Um, there are public centers that have been issued and then um, private centers, which obviously are not um, available to the public. And then our office uh, issues uh, quite a number of informal admissions and warning letters, which are confidential discipline. Um, these are not reported to the state bar. Um, if anyone called and wanted to know the history of their uh, disciplinary history of their attorney, we would not reveal the existence of a warning letter or an informal admonition. The only person who is, other than the practitioner, who knows about the warning letter or informal admonition would be the complainant uh, himself. Um, so those are confidential, and uh, we've been pleasantly surprised at the effectiveness of issuing confidential discipline. Um, usually when we issue a warning letter or an informal admonition, um, we don't hear about the attorney again. They, they understand the error of their ways, and they um, comport their, their conduct accordingly. Um, it doesn't always work out that way. We do have people that we hear about even after we've given them a warning letter, but it's, it's a very efficient way of trying to basically educate attorneys about the proper conduct um, before uh, the immigration courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals. So it's a fairly effective way of, of educating attorneys uh, without going through the formal process of filing um, uh, uh, formal charges. Uh, the chart on this screen gives you a, a pretty good idea of, of how the different types of discipline uh, shake out. Obviously, the disbarments are, are the fewest, which is the way it should be at 14 percent. Um, the suspensions are at 39 percent, and uh, because of our um, uh, sort of our, our increased uh, educational campaign in issuing informal admonitions and warning letters, those are now surpassing the suspended attorney. So you can see that we do spend a lot of our time uh, uh, issuing informal admonitions and, and warning letters to attorneys. Uh, the next slide will uh, represent the uh, reinstatements that I just talked about. Um, of the 1,077 attorneys who've been disciplined, um, 92 of those attorneys have petition for reinstatement and been reinstated and I think that that's only fair if you've been if you've been disciplined if you've been suspended and you've sat out your time or you've um, you've been able to fulfill the conditions for getting back in early then um, you should be able to be reinstated and and resume the practice of immigration law um, so uh, there, there was not a provision for reinstatement um, prior to 2000. So where do we get most of our complaints? Well, they come from all over. Um, obviously, a lot of the complaints that we receive come from clients. They come from aliens. Um, a lot of the complaints come from attorneys. These are typically attorneys who may be trying to pick up the pieces of a case um, from a former attorney, um, and they realize uh, what the former attorney did or didn't do for the client, and maybe in the context of a motion to reopen, um, they might fail, file a complaint with our office about the prior attorney's conduct. Um, a, a good portion of the complaints that we receive at EOR are from immigration judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, immigration judges know to email us um, or call us to discuss any kind of um, alleged misconduct that they may be um, witnessing in their courtroom, um, everything from failures to appear to frivolous filings, to contumelious conduct, to false statements. Um, so a, a good portion of the complaints we get come from the judges and the Board of Immigration Appeals. 
Um, we have a great working relationship with the Department of Homeland Security, and we work with them um, when um, when they become aware of misconduct by practitioners, and of course the state bars. Um, we are a member of the National Organization of Bar Council, in which uh, every state bar in the country is a member, and we work very closely so as not to duplicate our efforts with the state bars. Um, we help the state bars in their investigations, and they help us in our investigations. So it's a, it's a great working relationship that we have with the bars. Uh, there is a particular uh, complaint form, which is the EOIR Form 44, which you can find on the uh, EOIR website. Um, this is the practitioner complaint form. It's not a required form. Um, it's basically more for the general, uh, for the use of the general public. Um, we'll take complaints on on notebook paper or you know pretty much any form uh, format. But the EOIR 44 form is a is an actual form that we created. Um, when we assume responsibility for the attorney discipline program in 2000, and it's easily found on the website. So I've sort of alluded to um, some of these um, types of discipline. There are basically three types of disciplinary cases. We have the reciprocal case where the practitioner has already been suspended or disbarred by a state or a federal court. Um, we have attorneys who have been um, convicted of a serious crime, and that definition of serious crime is defined in the regulations. Both of those groups of attorneys um, are subject to an immediate suspension by the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, uh, this is basically because they've already had their day in court, either in a disciplinary matter or in a criminal matter, um, and have been found by another tribunal to have either been subject to discipline or convicted of a crime. So those attorneys are subject to being immediately suspended by the Board of Immigration Appeals. And then the last category are original jurisdiction cases where um, we are the first ones to hear about um, the attorney's alleged misconduct, and we will do an investigation and um, determine whether or not we feel that uh, misconduct occurred. Um, many of these original jurisdiction cases are resolved by issuing the warning letters or the informal admonitions that I spoke about earlier. Um, and if an attorney does receive an inquiry letter from us um, as a result of one of these original jurisdiction complaints, um, the best thing that an, an attorney can do is respond to that complaint. Um, the worst thing they can do is just pretend that it didn't happen and, and ignore the inquiry letter. Um, we will write two inquiry letters and give attorneys the benefit of the doubt that maybe they didn't get the first one or they just haven't gotten around to responding. So uh, we do write two inquiry letters um, before we go ahead and decide what to do with the case um, without the attorney's participation. But the best thing really is to participate, and um, that goes a long way um, in our eyes if we can hear the attorney's side of the story and, and make um, – an accurate determination as to whether any misconduct occurred or whether there were extenuating circumstances. Um, and we're very good at giving extensions of time. If 30 days isn't enough to respond, uh, attorneys call us all the time asking us for a little bit more time, and, and we're glad to, to accommodate them. So what we do when we first receive a complaint um, is shown on this slide where uh, we will conduct our own preliminary inquiry. The very first thing we do is write to the attorney, and we say, we've gotten this complaint about you from a client, from a judge, from the board. Here's a copy of the board's decision. Here's a copy of the immigration judge's decision. Here's a copy of the alien's complaint. And we give them um, an idea about what we think um, the misconduct might have been and which rules they may have violated. Um, and we want to know, we want to hear from the attorney, and we want to, like I said, we want to hear their side of the story. We want to see what their explanation is, because up until that point, we've only heard the other side of the story. Once we get the practitioner's response, hopefully we do, um, then we make a determination as to what we need to do. Has there been a violation of the rule? And if so, how do we want to deal with it? Do we want to issue a warning letter or an informal admonition? Um, is this the fourth or fifth time we've gotten a complaint about this attorney and we feel that we need to 
um, move on to filing formal charges. These are all things that go into our decision-making process as to what would be the best course of trying to, um, you know, educate this attorney as to um, why this conduct might be a violation of the rules. Um, so we need to determine the, um, the, the factual allegations, what rule was violated, whether or not it was serious misconduct. Um, and if we determine that we need to file formal charges, then we would file a notice of intent to discipline with the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and in that notice of intent to discipline, we would include all the information on this slide. We would um, uh, offer a recommended discipline to the Board, what we, in our experience, um, think is uh, a fair discipline. It could be anything from a private censure all the way up to, um, to disbarment. Um, if it's a reciprocal case, um, our policy is basically to recommend identical reciprocal discipline. So if an attorney has been suspended for five years in California, we would ask that the board suspend that attorney for uh, five years. The uh, practitioner has 30 days to file an answer um, once the notice of intent to discipline is filed with the board. Uh, and if there's no answer filed by the practitioner, then the board will go ahead and um, issue its own decision um, without the attorney's participation um, under the default provisions of the rule. Uh, when the attorney files their answer, um, if they want a hearing, uh, they have to ask for a hearing. It's not automatic. Um, and there are, certain, um, there are certain standards that the practitioner has to meet in order to uh, have a full evidentiary hearing. Uh, and if those, uh, if those standards are met, then um, the case is transferred from the Board of Immigration Appeals to the Office of the Chief Immigration Judge, at which time an adjudicating official is appointed. And an adjudicating official um, in most likelihood will be an immigration judge. It is an immigration judge who's been um, specially trained for this collateral duty. Um, it's an immigration judge who's volunteered for this collateral duty. Um, uh, we have uh, about maybe 12 immigration judges um, scattered all over the country who are our adjudicating officials. Um, and the uh, immigration judge assigned to be the adjudicating official to preside over the case uh, will not be an immigration judge um, who is who previously knows the practitioner or who um, sits in a court where the practitioner um, typically practices. So it's uh, a, a very neutral third party who who doesn't know the the practitioner um, at all. Uh, the time and place of the hearing is scheduled um, almost all the time. Uh, that will be at the immigration court that is located closest to where the practitioner practices. So that basically means that I, as the prosecutor, travel to wherever the attorney's practice is, the closest immigration court, and then the adjudicating official will travel. Um, this is for the convenience of the practitioner. Presumably this is where the practitioner, if he or she has witnesses, will. this is where the witnesses will be. Um, and it's most convenient for, for the practitioner. Um, so uh, if there is a full evidentiary hearing, then um, it, it goes along the, the course of a, a regular immigration hearing. Um, there are witnesses, documents. Typically, the practitioner wants to testify uh, in his or her own defense. Um, if the case involves a criminal conviction, uh, as, as in, as is, the practice in immigration court, we don't go behind the criminal conviction. We're basically looking at what it really only what will the type of sanction be. We're not going to relitigate the criminal conviction. If it's a reciprocal um, proceeding where the attorney's already been suspended or disbarred by a state or federal court, um, uh, the practitioner has a rebuttable presumption as to culpability for, uh, pursuant to the Supreme Court case in Selling versus Radford. Um, those factors um, include the attorney has to show that the underlying disciplinary proceeding was lacking in notice uh, or that there was such an infirmity of proof 
um, in establishing professional misconduct that the adjudicating official couldn't rely on the underlying proceeding or that it would be a grave injustice to impose discipline. Um, those are all very high standards and, and in my experience, difficult um, difficult to uh, prevail. Um, but uh, but that those would be the standards in order to uh, to get a full evidentiary hearing in a reciprocal proceeding. Um, when the uh, adjudicating official issues a decision, typically they, uh, the immigration judge takes it under advisement. It may be several months before you get a final order. Um, and then the practitioner has 30 days to file his notice of appeal um, with the BIA, and that's on a form EOIR 45, which looks very similar to um, the regular appeal form. And it goes along in, in uh, the same way that a, a immigration case would. The uh, transcripts are um, ordered, the briefing schedule is set. Um, we've never had an oral argument in an attorney to some case, but I suppose that's just a matter of time before we, we get to do that. Um, then the board will issue its final administrative order, and uh, there is the opportunity, of course, for uh, judicial review in federal court. And we've had, we've had several cases go to um, federal court. At this point, I do want to um, answer a question that I get quite often about the U.S. Attorney Discipline Program. That is, why does this disciplinary program even exist? Uh, every attorney is obviously admitted to a state bar somewhere, so they're um, bound by their own state bar rules of professional conduct. So why is the federal government even in the business of disciplining private immigration attorneys? And basically the answer to that question comes out of a Ninth Circuit decision, um, matter of Bogart, um, that uh, where the holding basically from the Ninth Circuit said that even though an immigration attorney might be suspended or disbarred by their state bar, they're entitled to some level of due process at the federal level, which requires notice and opportunity to be heard. So we give them that due process. Um, the, the summary of the Bogart case basically um, uh, is that Mr. Bogart was suspended in California based on a criminal conviction, and at that time INS initiated disciplinary proceedings against Mr. Bogart and then they promptly reversed course and decided to terminate the proceedings because they were um, basing that argument on the fact that Mr. Bogart no longer met the regulatory definition of attorney because he was no longer a member in good standing of a state bar. So the INS said, well, we don't really even need to do anything because he can't meet this basic definition. But Mr. Bogart objected, basically saying that he'd never had his day in court, he never had an opportunity to defend himself against the charges. He was just sort of unilaterally suspended. And the Ninth Circuit agreed, and they concluded that Mr. Bogart had a constitutional right to a hearing before the agency, before being denied the right to further practice before the agency, department regulations to the contrary notwithstanding. So um, Mr. Bogart finally got his day in court. Um, but that's basically the reason why we have this program, is that um, uh, we can't just rely on a, a state bar order or a criminal conviction. We have to give the attorney an opportunity um, to be heard uh, before the agency. Um, these cases here are um, fairly um, old precedent decisions. These were before EOIR took over the responsibility for the program in 2000. Um, the, the other case on this list um, on your screen, Matter of Sparrow, is another interesting case. Um, Mr. Sparrow was convicted for his involvement in sham marriages, um, and he was suspended in California, Maryland, New York, and Rhode Island. But he con continued to participate in the sham marriage business, and he also continued to practice law, and he was submitting what were at the time G-28s, which is the – what. DHS still uses CIS. We now use the ER-28, but it's the same form. He continued to submit those saying that he was a member of good standing in California and New York, even though that wasn't true. So uh, the board concluded in that case that an attorney who was filing um, a G-28 had a duty to disclose any disciplinary actions in jurisdictions other than those in which he claims to be in good standing. Um, the board basically said that it relies on attorneys to disclose on the G-28 when they're no longer eligible 
to appear in immigration proceedings or to simply refrain from appearing as long as the ineligibility exists. So I think that's an important rule because we don't have an immigration bar per se. You're not admitted to an immigration bar. You don't take a test or you're not sworn in or any of that. We're basically relying on each individual attorney to be um, forthright and honest with, uh, with their status and their state bars and the G28 uh, requires that attorneys um, be honest when completing those forms. Um, this next slide is just a sort of a, a compilation of the post rule uh, published decisions that the board has issued. And the one here I think that's most important is the very first one. Um, Matter of God was the board's first public decision after the new rule. And I think the reason that this is important is for um, the, the principle that um, was upheld uh, from the board through the district court and all the way to the Ninth Circuit. Um, Mr. Gata argued um, that uh, he'd been um, disbarred in California, and he argued that the, Cal the California lacked jurisdiction to suspend him or ultimately disbar him from practice because he only practiced immigration law, um, notwithstanding the fact that California uh, California gave him his law license. He, he was arguing California didn't have any jurisdiction to suspend him because he was strictly an immigration lawyer. Um, uh, the board dismissed this argument and found that there was no basis for arguing that he was not under the jurisdiction of the State Bar of California simply because he practiced immigration law. Um, and so the board's reciprocal disciplinary order was valid. He appealed to the circuit court, uh, the district court and the circuit court and lost in both of those forums. So um, uh, we relied on the California bar order um, and, and that was upheld. Um, we do have a list of all of the discipline practitioners on the EOIR website at this, at this link here. Um, if you're on the EOIR homepage, um, you uh, will find the Action Center block on the right side of the screen. Uh, you'll find a link for um, Find Legal Representation. If you click on that link, it will take you to another series of links. And uh, the one you want to uh, uh, click on is the list of attorneys and representatives who are currently ineligible to practice immigration law. And there are actually two lists. There's a list of currently disciplined practitioners and then there's a list of previously disciplined practitioners. So if anyone is interested in knowing whether their attorney is currently disciplined or has ever been disciplined, both of these lists will give you um, the information that you're looking for. Uh, the, date, the, the dates on these charts are actually hyperlinks to the board's actual order. So you can click on the hyperlink and you can actually see what the board said and what the basis for the discipline actually was. And these lists are constantly being updated um, whenever orders are issued, and they're also available um, via Twitter. So in summing up here, um, the future of the program, we are always um, trying to educate the public. We speak at AILA conferences. We speak at um, the National Organization of Bar Council conferences. Um, uh, we were you know, happy to do that um, under the current restrictions of our budget. Um, we tried to reach out to practitioners. Um, we created the Adjudicating Official Corps, which didn't exist before, and um, we're now moving on to uh, attorney registry um, as, as uh, one of our goals. So um, that pretty much sums up uh, my presentation. Um, I have uh, one program specialist to assist me. I have two attorneys within the Office of the General Counsel who help me um, on a part-time basis. Um, and I'm happy now to uh, open it up to uh, answer any questions. And operator, we'll wait to open the phone just yet. Um, first, we'll see if anyone in the room, uh, we'll give everybody a shot at one question before we open the phones, and of course we can come back to you uh, during the session as well. Any questions before anybody in the room? Yes, Mr. North. Um, I'm David North. I'm with the Center for Immigration Studies, which is a think tank that deals with immigration politics. I'm also a non-lawyer, as I'm sure that would be of this program. Um, I'm curious as to the percentage of original activities, investigations, whatever, as opposed to the, the total range of, of disciplinary action. Um, my sense 
from reading press releases that they see is virtually all of them are um, second hand that somebody else has already made the decision rather than the you know, uh, EOR. And I'm curious whether that might accept the rest. So, Mr. Hurd, are you asking whether your – what percentage of the disciplinary actions are – you were originated? Yeah. Okay. Well, well, let me answer that in two parts. Um, of, of the cases where formal charges are filed, where a notice of intent to discipline is filed, the vast majority of those are certainly uh, reciprocal discipline cases and attorneys who have been convicted of a crime. Um, we have uh, initiated several cases of original original jurisdiction cases that we have filed formal charges on, but those um, but those those are in in the minority. But we we will do it when we need to. We we try to address the misconduct through confidential discipline. But if if push comes to shove and the only way to get an attorney's attention is to actually go through and file formal charges, we we will do that. Um, but with our Limited resources, we have to be, we have to pick and choose the cases that we prosecute because um, there's only one of me and two part-time lawyers, so I, I have to use my resources wisely. And uh, usually, when you're filing a, a notice of intent to discipline in an original jurisdiction case, you're looking at several years of litigation. Who decides if you bring a case? Who do you take it to? The BIA? Well. We decide in, in our office which cases to prosecute, but right. the Board of Immigration Appeals is the arbiter. They're the tribunal that we take the case in front of, or, or an adjudicating official if we get to that to that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else in the room? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, it's not too far. Um, I was wondering what percentage of the cases that you are, are take on original jurisdiction what percentage of those result in a confidential discipline? And also, how do you measure the effectiveness of confidential discipline? That the cases don't come back to the lawyers, don't come back to you, so is that just kind of making an assumption that people don't hear from the social media problems as well? For those of you on the phone, the question is uh, what percentage of the cases EOR takes on are subject to confidential discipline, and how does EOR gauge the effectiveness of the confidential discipline? I guess it's it's very anecdotal, um, but I guess in in our line of work, no news is good news. I mean, if we don't hear complaints back from judges or the board or clients about this particular attorney, um, I you know one can only assume that um, you know if if they were engaging in misconduct, somebody would tell us. I mean, there's no way to really know that. Maybe they've gone to the state bar instead, and maybe or or. or They've dealt with their issues through a malpractice lawsuit or any other one of a number of ways to try to resolve an issue with your lawyer. But um, I guess the positive way of looking at it is if we don't continue to get complaints about a lawyer, then, um, you know, we're hopeful that that means that they've um, gotten the message and, and learned, you know, from, from their mistake. But it's really, it's just really, I guess, the glass half full approach. Um, uh, as far as the percentage of cases, um, that result in warning letters? Is that what your question was? Yeah, the Original jurisdiction. Um, oh, how many result in, in discipline? Um, a lot. I mean, um, you know, we... Uh, Is that primarily confidence discipline? Yes. I mean, we, don't, don't get me wrong. We have a lot of cases that, that come in as what we would call undocketed cases where you know, a client might be asking us to help them get their NAP certificate or help them get their money back from their lawyer or something that we don't have the regulatory authority to do. Uh, they might be complaining to us about an attorney who's already been disbarred. So there are a lot of complaints we get that we, you know, we can't, there's not a remedy for every wrong and we can't help a lot of people with some of those issues that they have. But of the cases that are docketed cases in which there seems to be a viable complaint that might be actionable, um, uh, the vast majority of those cases do result in some level of discipline. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't we wouldn't dock at the case and go forward. If we thought there was nothing there, we we wouldn't we wouldn't dock at the case. But if we dock at it, it's because we think that there's something there, and typically um, we we do find misconduct. And, and I don't want to belabor the point, but is that typically when it's original it's jurisdiction? type of discipline, how does that break down? 
The most, the majority of those will result in confidential discipline. I mean, we have a we have a policy of progressive discipline. We would very rarely, straight out of the box, file a, a, a notice of intent to discipline against an attorney. I mean, the chances are that that attorney has probably received two, three, maybe four warning letters or informal admonitions as confidential discipline from our office. Um, and uh, when we we get the feeling that maybe our message isn't getting across, then we, we will file a notice of intent to discipline. But it's not uh, it's not just straight out of the box. I mean, we, we, we do try to do uh, progressive discipline because that's the best use of our resources and it's the best way we feel to educate attorneys about, um, you know, what what's misconduct and what's not permissible. So um, I hope that answers your question. Any other folks in the room? Question: What uh, authorities do you have to find, find information about the practitioner? Um, do you have a subpoena power? What do you after you know, trust account records? No, we really don't. I mean, we don't have a, a provision to deal with trust account violations. If we get a complaint like that, we have to refer that to the state bar and let them do it because they they're in a much better position to subpoena bank records and and interview the attorney because they're they're there locally. Um, so we don't usually we don't usually get involved in those kinds of complaints. But if we get a complaint like that we would work the, with the state bar. For, for, for other kinds, do you still have some kind of authority to go out and get records or documents to support your prosecution? We haven't really had to do that. I mean basically what most of what we're relying on is is what's happened in the immigration court, which is all in the record of proceeding, or what or what we hear on the digital audio recording. So that's that's basically where we go to to get our evidence um, uh, from from the record of proceeding, from from the hearing, um, the digital audio recordings of the immigration hearings, um, or from people who witness the misconduct, anyone at the court or the client. Um, but we haven't really had the need to go much beyond that that circle. Okay, well, operator, we'll go ahead and open the phone lines. Thank you. To ask a question, press star one. The system will prompt you to record your name and please record your organization. Once again, to ask your question, press star one. One moment, please. Richard Breitman, your line is open. Uh, yes, a couple of things. First of all, the email or the website that you provided for the list of attorneys is not the one to go to. The one to go to is www.justice.gov forward slash EOIR forward slash discipline dot HTM. I was wondering if you have, by your experience, any knowledge as to whether or not those immigration judges, and most of them I assume are licensed attorneys, are at all subject to discipline before the state bars based upon their work in immigration court. Well, every immigration judge is a licensed attorney. Uh, that's a requirement of the job, so every immigration judge is subject to their own um, state bar rules. Um, and um, the Office of Professional Responsibility um, regulates all Department of Justice attorneys, which would include immigration judges. And a second question, if I might, what percentage of cases have you found no violation? Um, of the cases that we docket where we believe that there's prima facie evidence of a disciplinary violation, I would say that um, probably 90% of those cases result in some sort of confidential discipline. Thank you. You're welcome. To ask a question, press star 1. Nelson Castillo, immigration attorney, your line is open. Thank you um, for holding this, uh, this uh, seminar. Um, I have a number of questions. I was reading the, uh, the original email that came through 
that this was going to be a discussion about uh, professional contact rules for immigration attorneys and representatives. I, I, I understand that, but heard correctly that it's been mostly a discussion about the attorney side. So I have some questions. Um, I have two questions. Two, I have a number of questions, but the first question was about the presentation. And I wanted to get further clar clarification about how you go about determining um, a fee to be exorbitant. Um, I know that you, you put that on, on the slide. And then as a number of other questions, I have a, I, I'd like to hear more about the accreditor representative program. Because I am in Los Angeles, and there are a good number of accredited representatives here, and those that pass themselves out to, to be accredited representatives. And I would be very interested in, in hearing how you go about monitoring the accredited representatives because I have some serious issues with a number of them here in Los Angeles who are not listed uh, on the roster of accredited representatives and have been for quite some time now, in my opinion, practicing law uh, unlawfully, okay, and I wanted to. I would like to hear about that. Thank you, Mr. Castillo. I'm gonna. This is Lauren. I'm gonna stop you just for a second. The presentation is not about the recognition and accredi recognition and accreditation program today. We hope to have an event in the future that will focus on the RNA program, and we'd be happy to entertain your question during that presentation or offline at the email address or phone number that I provided at the beginning. Um, but I'm sure that Ms. Barnes would be more than happy to answer your question regarding the excessive fee. Right. The reason why I asked that question, and again, I'm going by the email that you wrote to all of us, uh, and that I got the instructions to log in, and it talks about both attorneys and representatives. I wouldn't be wasting your time in asking the question. Yes, I, I understand I, your question, and I appreciate that you've taken the time to join us today. However, like I said, the presentation um, is not about the recognition and accreditation program today. So if you have questions okay. about that, I'd be happy to take them by email or phone off, offline. Sure. Okay, so then as a follow-up to the just the attorney side, uh, could you further go into the statistics? Could you further describe the, if you do keep the statistics, about the total attorney complaints that have been filed, the uh, number of complaints currently pending? Um, and I think that the you know, question was, I think, already uh, asked about how, do, when all those total complaints are filed, what percentage of those um, uh, result in discipline. If I heard you correctly, you said 90%. Well, we have two categories of cases. We have undocketed cases and docketed cases. Undocketed cases are ones where um, uh, at first blush it doesn't appear as if our regulations would cover the misconduct that's being um, reported. Um, certainly when we get more information, an undocketed case may become a docketed case, but uh, generally speaking, um, undocketed cases don't result uh, in any kind of discipline. Docketed cases are ones where there does seem to be prima facie evidence that one or more of the rules have been violated. And of those, um, as I said, I, I, I would venture to say that probably close to 90% of those docketed cases result in some sort of discipline. I can't tell you the exact number of complaints that we have had filed over the course of the last 13 years, nor can I tell you the exact number of cases that we have pending. But I can tell you that uh, in a, as a general rule, we probably receive on an average approximately 400 complaints a year. Um, and now, again, I can't tell you exactly how many of those are undocketed versus docketed because I don't have the ability to um, run that kind of a report. Um, but uh, of the docketed cases, um, uh, it's a very high percentage of those do result in in some sort of discipline, typically just uh, 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 confidential discipline in the form of a of a warning letter. And and the other, um, I, I would, if I may, as a follow up, I I would highly recommend the statistics be be be, put, be kept as as much as possible. I have a great interest in making sure that our profession is as ethical as possible, and it doesn't take advantage of anybody, that we should know and should be able to know not only the public, but also we, who the bad apples are out there. And uh, it's good to monitor, and, and we, we, of course, want to. And I would love for you to have more resources if, if you are having an incredible uh, number of complaints, 400, and you don't have the, the necessary staff. I would love for you to investigate each one of those fully and prosecute them fully because uh, it's a shame if we do have any member of the bar 
who's uh, taking advantage of, of the public. Uh, as a final question, as I mentioned, the exorbitant fees, could you e e expand on that and could you, could you tell us what do you mean by that? Fortunately, we haven't had to rely on that ground, uh, that ground of discipline very often, um, but uh, it is set forth in the regulations what um, criteria we use to determine whether or not a fee is grossly excessive. Um, to, to date, uh, we've really only applied that grounds of discipline when um, a client has paid um, a large sum of money to an attorney and has gotten virtually nothing in return. Uh, I think that's clear that if you pay someone $5,000 and they do nothing for you, that that would be, by definition, a clearly excessive fee or a grossly excessive fee. We haven't had to um, uh, apply a lot of the uh, criteria in a more sophisticated way uh, because we just don't run into that, uh, that type of complaint um, all that often. This is Lauren. Again, I want to thank you. Thank you again for, for your answers, Ms. Barnes, and for holding this program. Thank you again. You're welcome. I'd also like to add, this is Lauren again, um, that in addition to outreach events such as this one being a priority for our director, Juanasuna, also the Unauthorized Practice of Immigration Law Initiative that this agency, along with federal partners, launched in the summer of 2011 is also something of great interest to him. And we agree with Mr. Castillo that there needs to be um, a, a crackdown, if you will, on bad actors such as notarios. And the agency, along with our federal partners, is hard at work to do what we can with the resources available to us to continue to um, work toward helping rid the system of, of those bad actors. Two. Thank you. To ask a question, press star one. Susan Bortman, your line is open. Hi, Ms. Barnes. Uh, my name is Susan Brotman. I want to know if your docketed cases are confidential or public. Uh, everything in our uh, in our process is confidential uh, up and up until if and when a notice of intent to discipline is filed. So anything up until that point in the process is confidential. The complaint, uh, the disposition, uh, the only person other than the practitioner who is informed about the outcome of the complaint is the complainant. Okay. I think I understand that. Um, the other question I have is about um, one of the the aspects of misconduct you said you come across most very frequently, at, le at least, is the failure of attorneys to appear uh, and on their matters. Is there is there any criteria for how often, um, how many failures to appear is is disciplinable, or is it on a case by case basis? Well, the regulation states that they, there needs to be repeated failures to appear. So we take a pretty um, strict view of that, and we define repeated as more than once. So if it's uh, two or more failures to appear, that's a potential violation of the rule. Uh, however, um, uh, without a doubt, uh, uh, complaints that we receive about attorneys who fail to appear um, are always handled um, by either confidential discipline, uh, as in a warning letter, or um, if we if we do get a complaint about a single failure to appear, uh, we will write to that attorney to let them know that we are aware of their failure to appear. We're interested in finding out why they didn't appear. We want to educate them that not appearing before uh, the court for a scheduled hearing is not acceptable. Uh, but we will dismiss a single failure to appear because it hasn't been repeated. But we want to take the opportunity when we hear about an attorney who's failed to appear uh, to educate them about their responsibilities to appear. I understand. Thank you very much. You're welcome. To ask a question, press star 1. And at this time, I have no questions in queue. 
If there's anyone on the phone who wishes to ask a question, we encourage you to do so now. We'll wait approximately 30 more seconds for you to press star one as the operator indicated. And if there are no more questions, we will turn back to the room to see if there's anything further before ending the call. Daniel Sharp, your line is open. Yes, I wanted to ask what uh, EOIR would consider sufficient evidence of a criminal relationship with an notario um, that would give rise to discipline. For example, would evidence of um, receipts for court appearances paid to a notario that are interspersed with uh, hearing notices where an attorney appeared in court be sufficient evidence generally to uh, discipline an attorney for a relationship with a notario. Um, and just from our perspective, that is sort of the worst um, of the uh, violations and uh, one that we, we would encourage uh, strong uh, discipline for. Well, obviously, we'd have to look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis. The provision that deals in the rules that deal with the unauthorized practice of law uh, makes uh, an attorney subject to discipline if they assist uh, a non-lawyer um, in the unauthorized practice of law. So it's a very fact-specific situation. Um, it, it's not easy to prove. Um, I, I don't have um, an investigator on my staff that can um, that can provide me with the expertise in, in exactly how to investigate that type of complaint. So it's very difficult to, um, to establish a relationship between an attorney and a non-attorney. Um, uh, typically, we uh, rely on uh, the various state bars uh, to uh, assist us when we get that sort of complaint. Um, more often than not, the state bar is aware of the situation and may already be investigating the attorney for such things as fee splitting with a non-lawyer or other violations of the state bar rules. Um, it's a very difficult area to, to investigate, um, and uh, fortunately we haven't had we haven't had too many complaints regarding uh, attorneys who are assisting others in the unauthorized practice of law. That doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means it's not really um, one of the more prevalent areas that uh, has come to our attention. Um, but there are certainly a lot of other means, uh, starting with state bars, uh, state attorney general's office. We have our own fraud program here at EOIR that deals with complaints about the unauthorized practice of law. So there, there are other, um, other entities and, and, and other offices that might be in a better position to investigate um, that type of complaint. Um, yeah, and just in the case of California, the state bar and law enforcement generally do not invest any resources in, in looking into this, and that's why I ask basically for your guidance on when the public or attorneys or recognized uh, agencies are going to file complaints, what kind of evidence, and it would be helpful for us if you would uh, give guidance uh, possibly on the website or in some other way on what kind of evidence we can put together, because we're aware the California State Bar rarely investigates these things, and, um, and we know that you have limited resources. And at least in the Los Angeles Immigration Court, it is a very prevalent problem. There are hundreds of uh, notarios operating in the Los Angeles area, and each one has an appearance attorney that that uh, represents clients in court. Thank you. I have no further questions in queue. Okay, this time we'll wait a little bit less time, about 10 seconds, uh, until I finish this statement. Uh, Ms. Barnes did mention uh, your Twitter accounts. If you want to follow us on Twitter and get the names of the attorneys who have been disciplined or changes in disciplinary status, you can follow us at hashtag D-O, sorry, not hashtag, at D-O-J underscore E-O-I-R. Operator, any other calls? I have no questions in queue. Any other calls from people in the room? Or any other questions, rather? Yes, Good sir. Good question. Um, if someone files an attorney files a motion to reopen based on ineffective assistance counsel, will that automatically get referred to your office for consideration? The question is whether a motion for ineffective assistance of counsel uh, reopen would get referred directly to Ms. Barnes' office. 
I'd like to think that it would uh, because um, uh, every week I get complaints that are re referred and forwarded to me from the Board of Immigration Appeals. Um, and I do believe that um, the staff attorneys at the Board of Immigration Appeals are aware of their uh, ability to um, refer a case to my office for um, review. And I do get a number of um, cases forwarded to, to me from the board where um, there has been an allegation of ineffective assistance of counsel and the board has made a finding of such. So, so if one wanted to do that, one, I guess, for example, just duplicate it. Um, well, basically, that's a sort of an um, intra-agency um, procedure. So the board has its own procedure for referring cases to my office, um, and y you would have, you know. From an attorney perspective, I, I thought you mentioned earlier there was a DIR form 44. That's basically um, the form that's used for the general public. Right. Uh, but if an immigration judge or the Board of Immigration Appeals files a complaint with my office, it typically is not on Form 44. I mean, it can be, but it's more of an internal uh, internal process. Are you wondering whether an individual attorney, uh, when filing a motion to reopen, could also file a 44 so that, in other words, in, to make sure that his case is heard in your office and not depend on our internal process? Oh yes, yeah. of course. Of course. I mean, I might get I might get the referral from the board, and then I might get the the, the complaint from um, from the second attorney, I guess you might say, who's helping the alien with the motion to reopen. So, yeah, I might yeah I might I might get it twice, and that's okay too. What you in very very broad terms, what do you find is your the biggest or the most common problem uh, that comes your way? The question is, what is the largest or uh, problem or most common problem that comes her way? Well, that's a really good question. Um, with regard to original jurisdiction cases, um, the most, uh, the complaints that we see the most are uh, regarding uh, competence and diligence issues and uh, uh, repeated failures to appear. I think those are the, the primary areas. Um, we do get you know, considerable amount of cases that involve misrepresentations to the court, false statements to the court. We get a fair amount of complaints about frivolous filings with the court and the board. Um, but a lot of our cases are uh, competence and diligence issues. Um, we have a fair number of complaints that deal with um, conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice. Um, so I would say that those are probably the front runners. Operator, are there any more questions that have come in on queue? I have no questions in queue. Okay. Well, I think we will end today's presentation and question and answer session. Again, we thank all of you who joined us on the phone or by web. If you're on the phone and you had difficulty with the web access, please do email or call us and let us know so that we can try to work out those technical issues for future presentations and events. Thank you also to those of you in the room who joined us today, and we look forward to working with all of you in the future. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.